as I stand here in Omlash, at the edge of the first Community Marine Reserve designation in the UK, I feel incredibly fortunate to have witnessed the recovery of this seabed since the no-take zone was established in 2008. Within the Lamlash Bay no-take zone and the South Arm Marine Protected Area, the recovery has been truly remarkable. Our own observations have been backed up by extensive monitoring by the Universities of York and Glasgow. We have seen lobster numbers quickly quadruple with overspill into adjacent fished areas. Scallop numbers have increased by four times in the no-take zone and by six times in the larger marine protected area in just four years. Our community are proud at having been at the forefront of marine conservation for the past decade. We made a small but significant start and we've proved the concept. We've shown you can bring a seabed back to life and it thrives. In a recent YouGov survey for the Scottish Government, over 80% of the public wanted government and businesses to do more to protect the marine environment. So now we look forward to seeing the rewilding of our seas at a scale. All that's needed is that we follow the science, educate the public and find the political will. We've proved it's doable. Here's to a bright future for our seas and all the people who depend on them. Today, while marine protected areas cover 6% of global ocean surface, fully protected areas are less than 1%. Many of them have no adequate enforcement at all. We just wanted to create one good example, a success story to share. We protected a piece of ocean, and now rewilding sea has shifted the tides for both ecological conservation and livelihoods of local community that directly depends on marine resources. The spectacular tenfold increase in fish stocks in protected areas spilled over to the fishing grounds. And within five years, the income of local community members increased 400%. The health of ecosystem have improved. Big species, Mediterranean monk seal, sharks, and big fishes have returned. Majority of the community members believe that protected areas with proper management and proper enforcement are essential tools for managing marine resources. So why we don't want to save the oceans against unsustainable exploitation of marine resources and climate change impact? We are ready to replicate this all over the world. We just need to bring together all the stakeholders and make it happen. There is a huge potential to achieve something amazing, bringing the life back to oceans as it used to be. My goal is to restore and protect the North Sea ecosystem. Uh, this is one of the busiest seas in the world and less than 1% is protected. There is a real competition for space going on. I've been working on marine protected areas and sustainable fisheries for over a decade and five years ago we started to complement these strategies with active restoration or rewilding. We have projects to actively restore sharks and rays and oyster reefs in the Dutch North Sea. And so two years ago I was given the opportunity to restore the first offshore oyster reef of the North Sea. Uh, but there was no space to do it. So I went to the fishermen and I said, you know, should we build this reef together? They're not exactly fond of conservation organizations and they also fish in this area, uh, but they still wanted to participate. And so we built the reef and they're now involved in the monitoring. And so even though our relationship is difficult with regards to uh, marine protected areas, for example, building something together really created positive energy. It was complete pioneering, uh, learning by doing, but it worked. And since then on the reef, we've observed survival, growth, uh, reproduction and recruitment, um, and also on our other reefs. And now people are really excited to get involved, uh, like the recreational dive club that we helped make their own reef on a wreck that they dive on, uh, hotels and restaurants that want to take part in our uh, shell recycling program. Yeah, so now that we know how to do it and it's not rocket science, I think we need to start sharing it in a way 
um, that everybody can participate because the act of restoring, being able to make a real contribution is very powerful. And personally, I have the hope that rewilding our ecosystems can help uh, to create a broader conservation community that can speed up reaching important marine biodiversity goals. The Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authorities have been reviewing their bylaws since their inception about 10 years ago. Here at Sussex IFCA, we started to look at the inshore trawling about three years ago. As part of this, we uncovered the story of the Sussex kelp forest that vanished in the late 1980s and early 1990s. A picture of the past was confirmed to us by local fishers or local divers, as well as from detailed surveys and mapping reports. This became the basis of an ecosystem-based approach for improving sustainable fisheries. We used the theory and language of natural capital and talked about essential fish habitats. We worked on the basis that the now extinct kelp forests of Sussex could be restored and once again become the ecological engine driving local sustainable fisheries. Because after all, you can't have fisheries unless you have fish. Additional benefits include carbon storage, biodiversity, water quality, coastal protection and tourism. The proposal itself is to prohibit trawling along the West Sussex coast out to four kilometres and in doing so help restore over 170 kilometres squared of kelp. We have great community support with over 2,000 people supporting the proposed bylaw. We of course had expected resistance from the trawling interest. The proposed bylaw was created by the IFCA in January and it now sits with the Marine Management Organisations and DEFRA for a final sign-off by the Secretary of State. In summary, the mechanism to get this sort of progressive work done is already there. Where there is a will to do so, the status quo can be changed. This is about the art of the possible. You can create significant positive change in the sea around us that benefits the environment, the community and the economy for the long term and you can do that right now. Seagrass meadows are incredibly productive and biodiverse systems. They're like a hidden wonder of our coastline, supporting our fisheries, um, protecting our coastlines and help mitigating against the problems of climate change. But in the UK, we've lost almost 92% of our seagrass. The people of this planet need seagrass. Our planet needs seagrass. And in the face of a, a growing climate emergency, a nature crisis, we need to fight back. We need to stop the losses and restore these systems for the future. For too long now, Governments have hidden behind a mantra that degradation can't be reversed, that we can't actually rejuvenate these systems for the, the productivities of our coastlines. But in fact, we've seen the results of that rejuvenation, that restoration in the US, and we're starting to do it in the UK now. We can restore our coasts. Yes, seagrass restoration is expensive. There remain many unanswered questions about how we undertake this, and from time to time there are failures but overarching experience and evidence suggests that we can restore these systems. In West Wales we have planted three quarters of a million seagrass seeds. We started to plant the seeds of hope to transform our coasts, to re-glean them. At the moment we're doing things at a sort of a scale that is, is akin to allotment gardening but we need to turn that into industrial farming activity to restore our oceans, to plant whole meadows that cover the thousands of hectares that they used to. We can restore uh, seagrass meadows, we can restore our coasts, and we need to start it with action and with support from the wider community and government. The Solent Oyster Restoration Project is restoring what was once Europe's largest and most productive native oyster fisheries. 
European flat oysters have been lost from 95% of their natural range and England's south coast is no different. Since 2016, Blue has been working with partners across the Solent to restore this iconic species. We've developed an innovative nursery system that allows us to hold adult oysters and get them breeding again, releasing millions of larvae into the Solent whilst also attracting local biodiversity. These nurseries have provided a window into the marine environment by bringing the seafloor above the surface. And we've developed a school's outreach program to show the local community why it's not only important to protect their native oysters, but the marine environment in general. In order for oysters to have somewhere to settle and grow, we're also restoring the seabed by introducing millions of juvenile oysters and culch to recreate oyster reefs that have been lost. To meet the demands of our project, we're working with the University of Portsmouth to develop one of the UK's first restoration-focused native oyster hatcheries at the highest possible biosecurity standards. Despite some legislative challenges along the way, we have restored 69,000 oysters and released billions of larvae year on year from our nurseries. We are now in a position to scale up our project and achieve real change for the Solent's ecosystem. Sturgeon are the most critically endangered group of species on the planet. And of those sturgeon, the European sturgeon is one of the rarest. So rare, in fact, that we didn't even realize that it was a UK species, but it is. And we know this because we've been digging through the records back into the 1700s, and we found over 1800 records of large sturgeon in UK rivers and estuaries and around our coastline. Blue Marine Foundation has formed the UK Sturgeon Alliance to restore populations of sturgeon in the UK. We're working closely with conservation partners in Spain and in France and in Germany who are doing similar projects. And actually we're seeing fish, tagged fish, from those programs actually coming to explore UK waters to spawn. Now sturgeon are a very fragile fish and if we dam rivers, if we create weirs, if we use gill nets in the estuaries, we can and we have wiped out these populations very, very quickly. So the UK Sturgeon Alliance is building on the foundations created by the Seven Rivers Trust, a project called Unlocking the Seven, which was designed to allow shad to move up the River Seven and spawn. And we think that sturgeon can do the same thing. So the benefits of restoring sturgeon are not just ecological, but they're economic too. What I want is for us to put our energy behind bringing these fish back into UK rivers. And in 10 years time, when these fish return to spawn, I'm so excited about watching these, these, these great fish come back to life. I'm standing on a salt marsh in North Wales. Behind me you can see a sand dune and beyond that there's mud flat in the Irish Sea. And over here you've got a sea wall protecting houses, businesses and local industry. So the sand dune protects a salt marsh. The salt marsh dissipates wave energy to protect the sea wall which in turn protects the lives of the people beyond. This mosaic of habitats and the interactions between them provide many more positive benefits for the natural environment and the people who live and work here than if the marsh existed on its own. Salt marshes are rich and active environments. Bees pollinate, birds nest, cattle, sheep, brown hare and small mammals graze and feed. When the tide's in, fish swim and crabs hunt in the creeks that wind their way through the marsh, depositing deep layers of carbon-rich mud. When the tide turns, nutrients flow through the creeks, feeding the mudflats and estuary and the seas beyond. But it's not just their physical value that makes salt marshes so important. Like all coastal margin habitats, they're also embedded in our public psyche. Who can forget the frightening figure of Magwitch in Great Expectations, hiding on the lawless marshes of North Kent? Or the iconic paintings of Sir Peter Scott showing wild geese floating onto the marshes of the Solway? My focus has been on managing and restoring salt marshes, taking down sea defences and recreating salt marsh on former agricultural land. The really exciting prospect of rewilding for me 
is the potential to restore and recreate not just a salt marsh or a seagrass bed or a sand dune or oyster reef, but a fully integrated and interacting ecosystems where the sum benefits will be greater than the parts. This is eminently possible. We need to bring experts together, from practitioners to policy makers, from artists to economists, and just see how far we can get with this approach.